I'm going to start a hot second early just to uh, get some business out of the way. Thank you to all of you who are here for Jocelyn's webinar, Map Collections. Uh, if you have somebody who is sitting with you attending this webinar and um, but didn't link in, so didn't use a registration link, if you could make sure to, I'm going to have a uh, check-in form ready for you in just a moment. It's not quite ready that I will put into chat to fill out and um, document that they also participated. So we make sure that everybody gets their LEU uh, certificates. And uh, we are recording this. So uh, it will be available on the Evergreen Indiana YouTube or Evergreen Indiana training YouTube channel later, probably maybe tomorrow, but maybe next week. Also, I just realized it's Thanksgiving next week. I mean, I had planned, but I wasn't like keeping track of the calendar. So maybe the week after that. Yeah, we're real busy. We've got a lot going on here. Yeah. <laughs> we just kind of been head down and then realized, oh, hello. <laughs> Everything happens next week. <laughs> There's a holiday. <laughs> and uh, and an upgrade. upgrade. <laughs> yeah. So, um, hey, let's get started. Good morning. Jocelyn is going to talk to us about maps. Thank you so much to you, Jocelyn, for being willing to convert what was going to be an Evergreen Indiana annual conference presentation to this virtual format. I really appreciate it. And I know that others uh, do as well. They, there are some people who got the ability to actually be here today because of that. So without further ado, I'm going to give it to you. If you have questions, uh, participants, those of you who are attending, if you have questions during the webinar, feel free to put those into the chat and I will be uh, keeping an eye on that. Keith will also be keeping an eye on that. And so we will do our best to get those questions uh, over to Jocelyn or whatever. Okay, take it away, Jocelyn. Hey, hi everybody. Thanks for attending this webinar on map collections in Evergreen. I'm Jocelyn Lewis. I'm the catalog division supervisor at the Indiana State Library. And just as a heads up, I am not going to be teaching you how to catalog maps in this presentation. I will be talking about map cataloging, but you are not going to come away from this presentation knowing how to catalog maps. If there is an interest for a webinar like that further down the road, I would be happy to give it. But the point of this map collection is really to start getting you to think about maps you have in your collection. Because I'm guessing you probably do have maps in your libraries. I'm guessing they probably aren't cataloged. Or if they're in Evergreen, they might be on not great records. So I want you to start thinking about your maps as important historic resources for your communities. So to start off with, let me get my cursor. Okay, this is the map room at the Indiana State Library. We have enough maps in our collection to warrant it having its own room. So when I first started here, I really had never cataloged any maps before and I had really negative feelings about maps, which I'm sure are shared with many of you. So first of all, they're very awkward to handle handle. They're big. They don't really fit in your desk like a nice book. Um, sometimes you have to lay them on the floor and you have to worry about your coworkers stepping on them. So they aren't conducive to being handled to be cataloged. Also, the cataloging rules, I'm not going to lie, they're also awkward and weird. They are not like um, monograph cataloging. And I'll go into that a little more later on. Um, cataloging map scales involves math, which is not something I particularly enjoy, um, but that's something that is pretty easy to overcome. It is easy to just shove them someplace and pretend they don't exist. You can fold them up, you can roll them up, you can stick them in a drawer, you can shove them on top of a cabinet. So it's very easy to just ignore them. However, if they aren't cataloged, how do you know what you have? And how do your patrons know what you have? And if they're not cataloged and you don't know what you have, then why do you even have them? What are you, what are you keeping them for? 
So at the State Library, most of our catalog, our maps were cataloged, although they were not on ideal records. So this is a screenshot of what the catalog used to look like. As you can see, we have four records. Two of them actually have the little icon for map. They're cataloged as a format map. And then the other two are in there as books. They also, the two at the bottom, the um, controlled headings for the Indiana State Highway Commission are not correct. So our maps were kind of a mess. They were in the catalog, but they weren't really in there in a way that made it easy to limit uh, searches by format or limit searches by um, agency or some other heading that was controlled. So I ran a report using Evergreen and of the 5,500 maps we have in the Indiana collection, uh, approximately half of them were on these poor quality records that were coded as books. So a significant chunk of them were um, not great. Since we're an OCLC library, this also meant that our OCLC holdings were not on the main OCLC records. So institutions like IU and the Historical Society, they might have their holdings on one record for a map in OCLC, and ours was just on this outlier <clears throat> book record. So this made it hard for us to determine which maps we have are unique to us because we want to prioritize the unique maps for digitization. I did have help um, from a volunteer who uh, used to be the head of reference here at the State Library. He's retired, but he still he likes cataloging. So, and he was game to catalog uh, um, maps and work on this project. So he would come in two days a week to help with this. Oops. So we pulled and handled every single map in the collection because even though half of them were on okay records, I did discover that cataloging rules have evolved quite a bit. So even if they were correct to the standards they were cataloged to like in the 90s, things have changed a little bit. So I wanted to take a look at some of those records and, and make updates to them when necessary. Also, we <clears throat> barcoded everything because um, we want to know how many copies of each map we have. Uh, we want to be able to compare different versions of maps. So it just ended up being easier to pull every single map and, and touch them. We started this project in January of 2020, and we were just going really fast through it. So I was really pleased and hopeful that this project wasn't going to be um, as onerous as I had thought it would be. But then the pandemic hit in March and I was kicked off campus and my volunteer wasn't coming in. Um, eventually when we were able to come back and work hybrid schedules, I was able to take some maps home and work on them um, from home. I had a whole map station set up at home to do these. So I actually got a lot done despite the pandemic. Um, we're looking at having this project finished by the end of the year. Right now, we're just kind of doing some final cleanup on it. And what this means for you is that if you do have maps at your institution, you can now compare your maps to what's already in Evergreen, and they should be decent records in there for you to compare to. And all you have to do if your item matches what we have is just to add your holding and you won't need to even worry about doing much record work. So as I've worked on this project, I've uh, come to have a newfound appreciation for maps um, as resources for your community that in addition to books that we collect on you know, our community and county histories, maps are also part of that. They tell stories of, of your community and your county and the state. So if you have maps sitting around and, and you wanna prioritize which ones are going to kind of get you the most bang for your buck um, patron use wise, I would highly recommend doing plat maps. Plats are just legal divisions of land but when people talk about plat maps, they're usually talking about maps that show landowners. So these are maps that show the divisions of land, but also list the landowner on it. This is very useful for genealogists or people who want to reconstruct property histories, um, especially for farmers. Uh, just as a heads up, the Library of Congress controlled term for plat map is cadastral map. 
that it's not plat matte. And that is not a term that anyone outside of cartography uses. Um, so just be aware that for all of our plat maps, they are all um, under the genre term cadastral maps because that's what Library of Congress says it has to be. We have digitized a lot of these and they're available in our digital collections, which the link is there. So this is one we've digitized. This is a map of Kosciuszko County from 1916. And this is a close-up of Prairie Township. I've gone through and I don't know if you can see it very well, but there are red um, lines around the plots that were owned by my great-grandfather, whose um, last name was Anglin. So if I look for other Anglins who own land and also highlight them, you can see there's a lot of them. It's a very um, common family name where he's from. And you can see a lot of the land, they are, um, they kind of like are next to each other. So as farmers died and um, left their land to their children, the land got divided and then subdivided and some divided. So you can kind of get a feeling that some of these were probably once full um, lots together. And in fact, my uncle who continues to farm some of this land has gone back and repurchased land that used to be long to um, the family. So this has a real good genealogical research value, um, especially if you're living in the country. Maps can also be used for house and building histories. It's not common, um, but some maps will show where buildings are on plots. And this can be really helpful with real estate research. And as an aside, some maps, especially maps from um, the 19th century will have engravings depicting prominent buildings in the margins. Um, so if there is a, an old mill in your town and it's being converted into like a microbrew or something, they might want to see a, an image of what the, the mill looked like in its heyday. So a map is a good place to go and look for images like that. So this map is really neat. Um, this is a map of Boone and Clinton counties, Indiana from 1865. The left-hand side is your standard plat map. It shows landowners um, in the countryside, but then all around it are these inset maps of little towns that are dotted throughout both counties. And for the town of Thorntown, which is where I'm from, if you look at it closely, there is the plot of land where my house is. And there is a little square on it, which is approximately where my house is situated on the plot. Um, so this is an indication that my house existed in 1865, which is pretty cool. And this is actually a map I worked on in that house during the pandemic. We don't have the original of this. We have a facsimile of it, but that was still pretty cool because I did not know that my house was, was that old. Um, and you can see across the street in 1865, there was a friend's meeting house. There is a church there. There's always been a church there. It's not a friend's meeting house anymore, um, but that was pretty neat. Now, Sanborn fire insurance maps, these are, are really, really amazing maps for your town. And these are for towns really only because they show detailed diagrams of the buildings and they were detailed for the purposes of, of fire and fire insurance, but they do kind of tell you stories about the houses and the layout of your town. A lot of times these are issued on multiple sheets, so they may be bound together in boards, in which case you would treat them like an atlas. Um, but if it's a really small town, sometimes they're just a couple of sheets. I was looking at um, the earliest one for Bloomington and it was, I think, 20 sheets. So they vary a lot based on the size of the town. Uh, many, but not all Sandbar maps have been digitized by you and are available um, online. Same with Library of Congress. However, there are some spots. It seems like a lot of the um, Sanborn maps from the 1920s are not available digitally. And we do have a, a pretty large collection of them on microfilm here, here at the State Library. So if you can't find one um, online digitally, we might have it on microfilm for you. So if you remember going back 
1865, that's where my house is. Now we're in 1886, so a little over 20 years later, and there's my house again. And this time you can see it's been built on in the back, which this is actually exactly what my house looks like to this very day. There's a little bump on the side that indicates the bow window. Um, so this is a really, really cool thing to see my house and its evolution. Um, and the only way, the only way, um, short of having photographs of it, which is not very common, is through maps. So you can see kind of how important maps are for, for not only individual houses, but if you look at this, there's uh, at the very end of the street, there's uh, just says it's a dwelling. Later maps says it's a boarding house and eventually it was uh, raised and it's now a church. So you can kind of get a sense of what your town was like at uh, um, different points throughout history. Another sort of map that's pretty cool are demographic maps because they can show who lived in your community and where they lived. And maps like this were often used for planning purposes. This is a map titled um, Distribution of the Negroes in Indianapolis from 1946. And this is one we have digitized and it's part of ISL's digital collections. And I picked this map because I actually encountered it on, on Twitter. Um, someone was using it to demonstrate how Indianapolis decided where to route the interstate system through the downtown area. And so what he did was he took our map that we digitized and he'd overlaid it with the current interstate system. And you can see that the roads are kind of going right through those, um, those blue colored areas. So, and this is just kind of a reminder of why we take the time to do things like this, to catalog them, describe them, digitize them is because there is a use for them. And, and this is an instance where the map was not intended to be used as an example of racism and um, infrastructure planning, but you can make the argument using a map like this. So, you know, this is why we do things like this. Um, election maps, political maps, they will show political behavior in community, your community over time. Apportionment maps will show changes in political districts based on population changes. And obviously we're going through that right now because of the most recent census, there is um, redistricting going on. This is a neat map. It uh, shows state congressional and presidential election results for 1852. And so you can see that the bulk of Indiana kind of seemed to vote like in uniform fashion. But, you know, we're 10 years out from the Civil War. So if you look at the southern, southern counties are all, they kind of seem to behave a little bit differently politically, which uh, you kind of would expect. So those are just some of the things that I've pulled out that I think are the sort of maps that tell stories of your communities. Um, now I'm going to do what I kind of just wanted this whole presentation to be, which was just to talk about maps I thought were cool from our collection, um, because we do have a lot of really neat maps. A lot of these are kind of more of a state level. Um, they tell the story of the state, not particularly individual um, communities. But these are some cool things we have. So our earliest map that I know of is from 1588, and it's um, called America or a New Description of the New World by a famous cartographer norm named Ortelius. So this is a beautiful map. Um, this scan doesn't really do justice to it. What's kind of neat about older maps is that other institutions who have them like to show them off. So it was very easy to find other institutions who not only had this map, but had also digitized it so we could compare ours to theirs. And what we kind of came to the conclusion was that ours is much prettier than what some of the other places have. But it also required some research to figure out which version we had. So it's very helpful to be able to like compare um, side by side what we have in our hand with what someone else has digitized. And this is a close up of the cartouche, which is um, hand colored. Someone wrote in ink um, who did it and what year it was. Um, I'm pretty sure this came to us um, 
with that written on it, I don't think a librarian did that at any point. That would be very disappointing. And then maps like this have a lot of really fun things in them. So if you look at um, one of the oceans, there's this ginormous fish there with, um, for some reason has red lips. So I think of it, it's, it's the lipstick fish. So this is also, I think, probably one of the prettiest maps we have. It's, it's a work of art. Um, but you know, going back, you can kind of see they're, they're kind of right. The outline's pretty correct. Um, but you can also tell that they haven't really explored much north of uh, what southern North America for this map. So moving up in time to 1719, we have this new map of the English Empire in America. So now you can see more clearly the land that would eventually become Indiana. Uh, I like this map because Lake Michigan is called Lake Illinovex on it. It's fun. This one is hand colored, but only the outlines. It's a lot of work to hand color everything else. So it's not uncommon to see maps where just some of the outlines are, are colored. And this map and the map before, and in fact, a lot of these early maps were probably removed from an atlas at some point. This is a French map um, showing Canada, Louisiana, and the English territories. And again, we can see the land that would eventually become Indiana. This is from 1755. And when a my favorite things about this map is the cartouche, which is what's up in the upper left hand corner. Um, the little decorative border around the title, it has a little beaver on it, which I think is adorable. This map is not adorable. It's not much to look at. It's, um, this is actually a photocopy of the original map. The original map needs a lot of work, um, but this is uh, called Plat of Hindostan. And this is a map for a town in Martin County that no longer exists. So in the early 1800s, it's estimated that Hindustan had a population of about over a thousand people and it was situated on the right White River. So that's a good spot to um, have commerce, trade and, and to build a settlement. But people just disappeared like in mass from it um, sometime in the 1820s and probably because there was an outbreak of a disease. So I've also come across across some other uh, maps that were for settlements that really no longer exist. And often it was like a mill that sprouted up somewhere and then a little town kind of sprouted up around it. And then when the mill died out, then the town just really disappeared. Um, so these are the sorts of things you might be on the lookout for in your collections, like it, things that describe towns or settlements that no longer actually exist. So 1814, we have the upper territories of the United States. We're getting closer to statehood. Um, but if you see, look at this map, we are completely landlocked. We get nothing from Lake Michigan, but you know what? Neither does Illinois. So Chicago is in firmly in Wisconsin territory. Um, but you can kind of see that the borders are starting to um, resemble what they would eventually become. A few years later, we have a new map of part of the United States. So this is from 1819. So Indiana has become a state, but we're still listed as a territory because, you know, news traveled fairly slowly back then, I guess. Um, the borders still aren't entirely correct, but again, we're getting closer. And at least this time, we do have some of Lake Michigan. So we're, we're getting there. This is a map of the town of Lafayette from 1841. Um, I like this map because it shows Lafayette, of course, but you can see an early um, layout for West Lafayette across the Wabash. But what really tickles me about this map is that there's no bridge linking the two. Um, it does, I know you can't see it, but <clears throat> you can see ferry landings. So there were boats going back and forth all the time. But this is one that when I went to catalog it, I did find that other institutions had something that seemed very similar, um, but ours really does seem to be different because it's hand colored. And also I found an image of one that um, I think the Tippecanoe New County Historical Society has, and there's really, it's not hand colored, but there's really looks like it's printed on a different kind of paper. Ours is on very heavy um, paper. So I think ours is actually different, even though essentially I think it is depicting the same map. 
So again, it's really helpful to be able to like compare what you have in your hand with what other institutions have. So digitizing and making them available that way is, is, is priceless to a cataloger. Another thing you might have in your collection are hand-drawn maps. This one is from one of our uh, manuscript collections. And these can be really important because for a lot of Indiana communities, especially very small ones, professional photographers didn't often travel to those towns. It, it wasn't very you know, cost effective for them to do it. So relying on um, a local person's map or their memory of, of what, how the town was laid up then becomes very important. This is a bird's eye view map, which are also called aerial views. And these, uh, I know this doesn't look very good. Um, you probably can't see it very well. This is an aerial view of Indianapolis. Um, and often with these, the focus is more artistic than cartographic. So it's not uncommon to find institutions that have cataloged these as a poster or an art print and not necessarily a map. However, if, I, if you can use this to get from one part of the city to another, then it's a functional map. And in this map, all of the roads are labeled, which I know you can't see, um, but you could actually use this to tell someone how to get from say Monument Circle to Riverside Park on the um, west side. So I, a lot of times they will be cataloged as a map, but just a heads up, sometimes they're not. This is one of my favorite maps. Um, this is a map of the IU campus from 1930. This is a pictorial map. So um, all the things on the map are represented by little tiny pictures of what they actually look like in real life. And although this again is elaborately illustrated and the appeal of it is mainly um, the aesthetic of you know, the image and not necessarily the function of it, you can technically use it to like say get from the football field up here to what used to be the library down here um, but again most this is mostly just kind of a, a, a picture and not so much a, a functional map but I really like it it makes excellent use of the uh, cream and crimson color scheme for IU this is another one of my favorite maps. I guess I really like pictorial maps. This one's from 1982, and it's just called a picture map of Indiana. Um, what's interesting is I really can't find a lot of information on either the cartographer, the printer, or the publisher, which is kind of unusual. And it's not held by many other institutions. Uh, but I think it's a really fun map. This is a close up of uh, South Bend. You have a little football player. And then below that, you have Lake Naxonkucky and Culver Military Academy. And then there are also some like little fun vignettes, like under Martinsville, it says 75% of all goldfish in the world are hatched here, which I have no idea what that's about. I haven't looked into that. It's uh, very intriguing. And finally, um, we have this map, which I know it's not as neat as some of the other maps. This is called um, Franklin County, Indiana, preliminary land use map. We have maps for, I'm pretty sure all of the counties um, for this. This one is hand colored um, and it shows the different kinds of soil in Franklin County and what they um, are, the government recommends they be used for. So this map was created by the Franklin County Land Use Planning Committee, so by a local committee in conjunction with the US Department of Agriculture. Now, in the late 1920s and early 30s is when the Dust Bowl happened. So, and one of the reasons the Dust Bowl happened is because of not great farming techniques being used by people, mainly in like Oklahoma and, and Western Kansas. But the government had a keen interest on making sure that people were using land in a way that didn't degrade the soil, thus causing another dust bowl. And therefore you get a series of maps like this, which are helping local farmers make best use of their land. So map cataloging, now we're gonna get to the not so fun stuff. <laughs> um, this is what you'll need 
to do map cataloging. You're going to need a tape measure and make sure it measures centimeters and that you can clearly read the centimeter measurements. I found that out the hard way. You will also need a ruler for scale measurements. Um, it doesn't have to be as detailed as that ruler. It can be whatever ruler you use for measuring your books should be fine. You're gonna need space. So you're gonna need a big table or lots of dedicated floor space. I recommend getting a magnifier because a lot of, um, there's a lot of important data and maps that are printed very, very tiny and very, very weird places. So a magnifier can help with that. And then the best tool ever created is this map scale calculator. And I will get more into that later. So for storage, you really want to store maps flat. If you um, are keeping them folded, they're eventually going to weaken at the folds. And every time you unfold them, they're going to just cause more strain on the map itself. Same thing with um, having it rolled up. It's just going to make it really hard to actually use it when you need to use it because it'll be all foldy or rolly. Um, so when you're storing, you also want to be careful what you're placing next to your maps. So if you store a map next to one printed on acidic paper, that can cause acid burn and extreme discoloration. So this is a map that we recently found in a drawer. And it had another map on top of it that was printed on um, like a newspaper type material. And so when we lifted it off, it was uh, the imprint you can kind of see of that newspaper map is like burned onto the paper. I highly recommend getting a pH testing pen. Um, so if you're not sure about the acidity of an item, you can test it with the pen. They're like $10, you can get them on Amazon. Um, and if you do have something that is acidic, you wanna like put it in like a, a folder that's non-acidic or at least put like some non-acidic paper um, in between that and the other maps. Okay, so now we're moving on to um, basic cartographic terms that you'll need to know if you're dealing with maps. The first is obviously cartographer, and that's the company or person responsible for drawing the map. You are never gonna see a map that says cartographed by or cartography by, so just keep that in mind. It might just say by, like this map just says by Ezekiel Timmons. Um, but that he is the person who is responsible for the map. So he is the cartographer. Often with older maps, the cartographer is usually whoever the local surveyor was at the time. You'll want to use the relator code subfield e cartographer with these to identify like this person's relation to the map. And with modern maps, the cartographer is usually the company which also published the map. So it's a little bit easier, but with older maps, you need to look out for a surveyor or a, a actual name of a person who is responsible for the map. Lithographer is a company or person responsible for printing the map. So again, with older maps, it's not uncommon for there to be someone responsible for creating the map, the cartographer, someone responsible for publishing the map, the publisher, and then a lithographer is responsible for the printing of the map. So when this happens, you want to transcribe the lithographer in a 264 second indicator three field, which is for a manufacturer. And then be sure and add them as a 700 field with the relator term um, lithographer. A lot of the lithographers I've come across are in the Library of Congress um, authorized database. So there's an authorized heading for them. I haven't come across that many that weren't in there. And some of these lithographers operated out of Indiana. So we definitely want to be able to access them um, by a 700 field in case we want to see um, examples of the work from certain lithographer studios. A map recto is the front of the sheet where the map is actually located. So this is the recto for this map. You are not actually going to see the term recto very much in um, map cataloging, but you are going to see its opposite, which is map verso, which is the back of the sheet. And you will see the word verso all over the place in map um, cataloging 
records. So again, recto is the front where the actual map is located and verso is the back. A cartouche is a decorative frame on a map, often containing title and publishing information. This is much more common in older maps than in modern ones, but they can be quite lovely, um, like this one from a uh, map of Richmond. An inset map is a smaller map inset within a larger map, and it often shows more detail of a portion of the larger map. So this is actually a massive map of Tipton County, and this is the bottom part of that map. So this map has five inset maps showing five different communities within Tipton County. A locator map is a simple map used to contextualize the main map in a more familiar geographic area. It's also sometimes called a location map. So this is a map of um, Indiana Dune State Park. And then you see in the corner, we have an outline map of Indiana that shows exactly where in the state the Indiana Dune State Park is, and that is called a location map. This map very nicely tells you that's what it is. Um, a lot of times it'll just be a map somewhere. It won't say locator map, it won't say location map, but that's what it is. There's a question, Jocelyn. Uh, mm -hmm. If maps are printed on both sides, is there a standard for recognizing which is the recto and which is the verso? I will definitely be getting to that. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, dissected maps are maps that are separated into parts and mounted on cloth, usually linen or muslin, and then folded into boards. And this is an example of one we have here at the State Library. We actually have quite a few of these. Um, and this is what it looks like when it's all folded up. So it kind of looks like a book. Now, some maps are manufactured this way, um, but in most cases, I think a library or some other institution did the dissecting. I think that was done as a, a way to more easily store maps, but it actually makes them really hard to use because you actually have to mute, you know, uh, mutilate the map to do this. So there's this gap where the, the, it's just cloth. And then cloth over time can be, um, become unstable and can rip. So ideally we would like to have our dissected maps put back together and be whole so we can store them um, flat like other maps. But just be aware you might have some of these in your building. Okay, finally, we're gonna talk about map scale because this is the thing that I always mentally kind of tripped up on with, um, cataloging maps. A map scale is a ratio expressing the distance on the map and its corresponding distance on the ground. So in this example, three inches on the ruler equals approximately, approximately, not exactly, one mile on the map scale. And in all honesty, before I took a digital photo of this and went in and like did the little hash marks, when I eyeball it um, from my desk, it's like, three inches is about a mile. But when I look at it here, it's like, it's more like it's two and three quarter inches is a mile, but you don't really need to worry about being super specific because we're really going for approximately. Um, so when three inches on the map equals one mile on the ground, the scale is one to 21,120. And how did I figure that out? I used an online map calculator. So this is a free um, map calculator, which will tell you the scale. All you have to do is put in your numbers and it will spit out a scale for you. It's wonderful. I love it so much. Honestly, you don't really need to know anything about math anymore because of the internet. You can find calculators and things all over the place that will just do math for you. So the internet might bring about the end of civilization, but at least I don't have to do math anymore. So I highly recommend um, having this up and running whenever you're dealing with maps. And also don't stress out too much about map scale. I don't, it's not really something that's ever gonna be like, oh, I don't wanna look at that map because that's not the map scale I'm looking for. You're really not gonna get that. Um, you'll only get that if you're like in a, a, a library that specializes in like geology or, or, or something like that. So don't, don't stress out too much about the scale. Um, it's a 255 field. It's, it's common. 
but don't, don't stress out about it. Okay, so to the question that we had earlier, I've got a few examples um, set up here. Again, I'm not teaching you how to catalog per se, but I am teaching you, I do want you to know how to interpret um, map records when you come across them. So example one, <clears throat> we have a map here, um, one side, this is the um, recto because that is where the actual map is located. And then we have the map verso, which is, this is the back. <clears throat> now with map cataloging, what you're describing is just the map. That is principally where your information is coming from. So the outlined area here, this is what you're describing in the bib record. This is where you're gonna take the title from. This is what you're gonna measure. This is what the bulk of your description is gonna come from, which is crazy because this constitutes less than half of this entire resource but that's how map cataloging works. That takes some getting used to, I'm not gonna lie. You will get used to it eventually, um, but it is a little difficult. So when possible, you wanna take the title from what is on the actual map. Now, if I gave this item and put it in front of 10 different people and said, tell me what the title is on this, a lot of them are probably going to go over here because when the item is folded up, that's the cover and it says Dune Land, Indiana Dune State Park. But that with maps is not the preferred source for the title. You definitely, definitely wanna add that as a 246 field. So it can be retrieved by title because a lot of people are going to assume that is the title. But cataloging rules prefer you take the title from the map itself. This actually has a locator map, which I talked about earlier. So this is just like a close up of the Lake Michigan shore, but it shows exactly um, where Indiana Dunes State Park is located on it. And then all of the other stuff you don't really do anything with. You just will add a 500 field that says text illustrations locator map on Verso. That's it. So the majority of what the resource is, you don't really really spend a lot of time dealing with. So moving on to another example, this is a more modern map. So this is the front and this is the back, the verso. Again, what's in the red square is the actual map that you're gonna be describing in the bib record. So this is what you're gonna measure this is where you're going to get the title. This is where you're going to take most of your information. It's the first source for the information in the bib record. The title's right there. It's not a very cute title. It's just Decatur County or Decatur, Indiana, Adams County. Um, so with modern maps, they are full of advertisements. And sometimes you kind of got to look at them very closely because something that at first glance looks like it's an advertisement is actually the publisher. Um, so in this one, it's uh, Community Graphics did this map, but it looks like it's an ad. It's with all the other ads. This map also has a street index, which is notated in the record, but it's the same as an, in a book. It's just to say, yeah, there's an index here. You don't have to really go into any detail with it. It's just a 500 note saying includes index, includes street index or, or whatever you want to say. And then we have this whole backside that's got all this text. There's another map on it. Um, there's pictures. And really all you do with it is you just create a, a single 500 field that describes the whole thing. So text, color illustrations, and county map on Verso. You don't really need to go that much more in depth with what's there. Now, you can if there are things you want to um, indicate you can, instead of just saying a generic text, you can say there's a county history, a, a local attractions list. You can be a bit more specific if you want and you think that's going to be helpful. But the, the bare minimum is you just have to say there's stuff on the back. And so that's really, it's really difficult because you have so much information on both sides of these sheets. But what you're really, really spending most of your time um, focusing on is just the map itself, which is just what's in the square. And sometimes 
is the map is so small. It's like less than, um, you know, like it's a quarter of the entire resource itself. So that's um, what takes getting used to. Um, then you have an example like this, where you look at both sides and you're like, I have no idea which side is the front and which side is the back. And sometimes a single map isn't the, the main focus of it. And so in instances like this, this is where there's no, there's nothing really on the maps themselves that indicate their titles. Um, so this is one where you can pull the title from the panel. Um, so usually those make for good titles. This is not a great title um, because the title for this is going to be map, map slash guide Bedford Mitchell slash Lawrence County, Indiana. So it'll look like that and it's 245 in the 300 you will say three maps on one sheet or five maps on one sheet or however many maps are on there um, and you have 500 field you can say includes advertisements indexes and community information each of these maps is indexed i know you can't really see it very well so you don't have to um all you have to do is just make a comment saying that they're indexed um, then you have to figure out who made this. So this is one where, again, you've got to look in the margins. This is where a magnifier will come in handy because in this map, it's it's right here. Um, and this one, because it's a modern map, usually the cartographer and the publisher are the same entity. So Hampton Publishing is responsible for the creation of this map and for publishing this map. So if you have multiple maps, you can just put a generic to 55 saying scale varies. If you really want to, the 255 is a repeatable field, so you can put in multiple scale values. Um, and the 264, I have um, 1999 in brackets because there's no date on this, and that is not unusual for maps, unfortunately. So the date was given by someone who, when they got it at the State Library years ago, so I trust that date. Also, you can kind of date things um, by looking at the ads. This is, they're annoying, but they're also kind of helpful. So none of the ads um, on this map had like a URL or an email in them. So that means it's probably sometime in the, um, the late 20th century. Um, and if you're doing one for your community, you might know like that ad for that diner, that diner went out of business this year. So it can't be you know, published after this year, you might be able to um, narrow down and, and get a better date uh, based on things like advertisements. And um, so that's kind of the examples I have in there, um, almost to the end, and then we can do questions. Future map projects at the State Library. Um, we've been weeding thousands of government maps, so that's gonna allow us to expand our Indiana map collection quite a bit, which is good because we're really kind of busting at the seams. We're gonna continue digitizing maps. Um, a couple of my colleagues have applied for an NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities grant, and if we get it, we're gonna use it to fix maps that are unusable and unstable so that they can be digitized. And just as a heads up, there are um, gonna be some maps still in Evergreen that are gonna be on not great records. And that's because there are these maps. They are um, in such a state that handling them is probably going to cause further damage to them. So we're kind of gonna wait and see if we if we get this grant and we can get them fixed and then, to, um, then I'll be able to, to properly catalog them. Um, they're not a ton of them, but they are some of our really neat maps, unfortunately. Um, with the art uploader feature coming in 3.7, um, I'm thinking about adding um, images uh, for the maps that we do digitize. So if you're looking through Evergreen and you see a little map thumbnail, that's an indication that that's a map that we've digitized. And we always put links to the digitized maps in the record in Evergreen. So also, if you are cataloging maps and you want to see if yours is matches what we have, if it's been digitized, there'll be an 856 link in there. You can click on it and then you can see, um, you can compare the maps. So with that said, 
If you guys have maps that you don't want and they're Indiana related, we are interested in them. Um, if you have a patron who desperately wants to give you some old maps, we're interested. Uh, we'll even take plat books. We still buy um, modern plat books. So we would be interested in those because we're really, really, really into maps here at the State Library right now. Um, but hopefully if you do have maps and you do want to add them to your collection, this is gonna be kind of a starting point for you or maybe a starting point to think about doing something with your maps because uh, they are really important uh, parts of our history. And I think they tell a lot more than people think they tell. So we're at the end. Um, I have some links here for you, our digital collection links. IU has their Sanborn maps digitized, although that website is not working really great right now. I'm not sure why, but they do have a little message acknowledging they know it's not working. Um, IU also has a, a historic maps uh, database for maps they've digitized. The Library of Congress has a ton of maps digitized, but they also have a ton of maps not digitized that I'm sure they have. They're kind of, a lot of institutions, maps have kind of been like at the bottom of the list of things to do, which again, there are reasons for that. They aren't fun, but they do need to be done. And then if you're into maps at all, the David Ramsey or Ramsey collection at Stanford it has a ton of amazing maps. Um, might even have maps of your community, um, some really early ones. And then if you want to start, you know, doing a little cataloging, Yale has a very handy cartographic cataloging guide um, that can like walk you through field by field how to do um, map cataloging. Okay, I'm about to lose my voice. So are there any anyone, questions? Any questions? <laughs> Do you have any quick recommendations for the best ways to sleeve maps? Well, we have a we have a sonic welder here at the State Library, which <laughs> I'm sure you guys don't. Uh, do not run them through a laminating machine. Um, but you can buy mylar sleeves from places um, like Demco and, and Gaylord that are just kind of pre-cut, you can cut them down. It's basically, they're almost like a folder, a clear folder that you can slip maps inside of. We do have some maps that are, are being housed that way. Uh, but do not run it through a laminator. Don't put anything adhesive on it. That's bad. And is, is, it, is Gaylord Archival, are they still that branch of Demco that's? Uh, they have things on their website you can't buy through Demco, but they do have some products you can buy through Demco. Okay. I'm guessing something like that, you probably would need to buy it through the Gaylord website directly. Mm -hmm. Anything and, else from anybody? And this is something if you have a friends group or a local historical society, you know, Maybe be like, hey, can you help us out with this? We really want to, we really want to make these available to people. Well, I don't see any other questions, Jocelyn. Thank you so much. This was really inspiring. And because this is kind of just like down the hall-ish for me, I want to go look at things, but I have other <laughs> things to do, so I'm not going to. <laughs> Thank you everybody for attending. I'm going to put the link uh, into chat real quick in case there was somebody here with you that was not logged in to, and I say that, and I did absolutely not what I said I was going to. There we go. Uh, if you need uh, somebody to check in, but if you see your name listed in the attendees, you don't need to, to fill in that form because we have a record. And Jocelyn, am I correct in saying that we will have the slides available um, for yes. when I send out the... Okay, cool. So we'll send out the presentation as well as your LAUs when all of that gets compiled. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you to Jocelyn and I hope you have a great day.